Well, thank you for that invitation. Uh, the uh, situation here is that I uh, have for about, I don't know, five or six years had discussions with Kat. And she used to, when we were talking about collaboration, she would walk around and just show me the sites from <clears throat> Her, her, uh, her office is like right here. Mine's like down here. So you notice I can't see quite as much. But uh, <clears throat> if you know cat, resistance is futile. So, uh, so um, I do cancer stem cells. And uh, <clears throat> I started in this field because I didn't believe in them. And Rob Wessler Ray and I used to have a joint lab meeting at Duke. And he just talked about these things. But over the years, uh, I'm going to uh, kind of share some of the lessons that I've gained mostly through ignorance um, and being hit over the head from the biology of these cells. So we recognize for a very long period of time that there's a heterogeneity within cancer. And I want to be clear on this, that cancer stem cells are not a replacement for all of tumor biology. They're just one aspect of the tumoral heterogeneity within the neoplastic cell compartment. Um, and they have characteristics that you see over the uh, top here in terms of uh, these characteristics that are very much like what you would have in normal stem cells, the recapitulation of a tissue. There's a lot of argument over frequency, uh, the uh, markers, and uh, one of the nice things that was said earlier today is that the single cell RNA-seq data really show that there's such a diversity of cell populations that we're trying to create a two-state solution, and it's harder than Palestine and uh, uh, Israel. Um, and you know, the fact is that there's a, a diversity of cell types. And then the, the multi-lineage differentiation, cancer is disrupted in its uh, differentiation state. So we really don't need to have multi-lineage differentiation. So I'm going to share some of these uh, messages that I'm going to give to you. Um, and the first thing is the cancer stem cells are important. So I was wrong that Rob was right. And if you know Rob Wersorea, you know he's right about everything. Uh, but uh, they're not everything. So we started this um, some years ago. And I, I suggested that we look at radiation. And long and the short of it is that it turns out that uh, cancer uh, stem cells have a preferential ability to respond and uh, create a survival mechanisms um, for DNA damage responses, particularly here in radiation. We also found at about the same time reported within just a couple months that they also drive the angiogenesis. So there's both a, an autocrine and a paracrine contribution to tumor growth from these cell types. And so collectively, if we recognize as a clinician that proliferation and apoptosis is what we tend to study in a dish because it's easy to study, but the reality is that tumor spread, immune evasion, and angiogenesis are key features that really are contributors to cell the patient dying. In addition, where these cells live, and we heard a very nice discussion about uh, hematopoietic stem cells earlier, and we'll get to kind of this location, location, location. So I'm trying to sell my house in Cleveland still. It hasn't sold, and it's about really 10 percent of the price that the smaller house I live in right now is for. So um, that's a great example of niche dependency. Uh, <laughs> so message two, uh, cancer stem cells are really a kind of stress response. We've heard about some of the responses that, that occur. Um, and what we see consistently is that these cell types are not uniformly distributed. What they have is a distribution around specific areas. And a lot of times what we do is we treat these areas in a way that's kind of anthropomorphized, if I can pronounce that correctly. Uh, the, the real issue, though, is that I think what we have is an organizational unit. So uh, one is the blood vessels, what we already heard about, and then the other is a kind of hypoxic niche. Uh, and these are actually the two key features that histologically define glioblastoma. Um, and then also they give rise to the cells. They're not necessarily invasive themselves, but they give rise to the invasive populations. So the first kind of stress is hypoxia. And what we know is that uh, low oxygen states are um, actually uh, areas that you see increased uh, stem cells in the normal tissues. Actually, if we think about the uh, fetus, where you have the most stem cells, um, you see hypoxia again. And so we looked at hypoxia. And this was some years ago. And, and we demonstrated that hypoxia uh, through a series of paper that hypoxia enriches for cancer stem cells, but also that there's different cancer stem cell specific molecular mechanisms, in this case HIF2-alpha. 
and even around areas of the blood vessels, which we tend to think of as being closer to normoxia, um, you actually can see even 5% O2 that HIF2 alpha levels are higher in this population, and that's because it's both a transcriptional as well as a post-translational uh, regulation. And what we can see is that this is kind of a two-story house. You need both HIF1 and HIF2. If you target either one of these, you see a, an inability to form tumors. Um, even more powerful in our hands in hypoxia is pH, and if you look at the low pH uh, conditions, um, we can actually see dramatic induction here. These bars are stem cell markers, the mRNA levels. Um, again, this is published some time ago, but the bottom line is that you see non-stem cells become more STEMI, uh, as well as cancer stem cells uh, being locked into that stem cell state. Uh, also, glucose, so glucose is one of the main uh, sources of carbon, uh, and what we can see here is that if you use a more physiologic glucose level, you see uh, in here in red bars an induction of stem cell factors. Again, this was published some time ago, so I'll just briefly state that um, one of the problems we have is we culture our cells in conditions not representative of cancer, the wrong pH, the wrong oxygen levels, and the wrong amount of nutrients. Uh, and the wrong lactate as well. And the net effect is that we're pushing cells to proliferate and differentiate. And it's not shocking that our therapies are not really well designed uh, against these populations. Um, so the glucose situation is kind of interesting. What we're able to do is differentially label the red cells of the cancer stem cells, blue the differentiated cells, and give a green glucose after these have been put into brain slices. And you can see that the really selfish cells, these um, are the cancer stem cells and all the green goes there. Um, I'm not going to show you the data today, but uh, we published in Cancer Cell a couple years ago that the same thing happens with iron. So basically, these are really selfish cells that take up specifically the things that they need. Um, in the case of glucose, what we found is that there's a high affinity uptake mechanism called GLUT3 that's preferentially expressed and can be a therapeutic target. And actually, uh, Dave Cherish just published a very nice paper in Cancer Cell where he showed that the integrins determine the GLUT3 uh, uh, localization. So more recently, uh, we've done some glucose tracing experiments. This is the most recent publication, but there's lots of others in the work. And uh, there's, this is just a nice report by Xu Xing, who is here. Um, and he showed that there are de novo purine uh, synthetic intermediates that are enriched in the cancer stem cells preferentially. And you know, it's not just that these cells are proliferating. The reality is that the, these intermediates are being used for lots of other things, and probably even more importantly in terms of signaling. So uh, cancer stem cells shouldn't just be studied in a dish. Um, so some years ago, Richard Gilbertson and I had a proposal. Uh, this was really controversial when it went to review, believe it or not, and the, this is the idea that cancer stem cells here have the same kinds of interactions with their microenvironment that normal stem cells do. So we got a lot of pushback from the reviewers. Uh, but basically the idea is that uh, normal stem cells interact with their microenvironment, blood vessels, differentiated progeny in the ECM. Uh, and shockingly, the same thing happens in cancer. Uh, so one of the things we're doing is to look at organoids. We were the first to do brain tumor organoids. And when we say we, I mean not me. So uh, Chris Hubert is a very talented postdoc. And he just basically spent a bunch of money because if actually you put a, a shaker in a, an incubator, it rusts very quickly. Um, so don't do it. Uh, uh, but what we were able to see is that a lot of people report that they have organoids. And they grow organoids in like 7 or 14 days. I have bad news for you. Those are not really organoids. Those are like big balls of cells, those spheroids that we talk about. And when we look at cells, single cells, and we implant them in mice, what we can see is that actually organoid-derived cells actually recapitulate the original tumor much better than the sphere-derived cells. And they also have very interesting characteristics. The outside has SOX2 positive cells and has Ki67 positivity. The inside is hypoxic, not surprisingly. If you radiate the organoids, what you see is the cells that are dying are the non-SOX2 positive cells, mostly on the outside, the proliferating cells whereas there, there's large areas of quiescent populations in the center. So, you know, it's a really tough thing to study quiescence. We study proliferation, but we all recognize quiescence is a real big issue. 
Further, what we can do in partnership with our neurosurgeons is have biopsies in different regions, derive different organoids, and they retain phenotypes uh, that are in differential areas. And so uh, we also wanted to start thinking about things about how to really do discovery in the context of in vivo situation. And one of the things that we did um, was uh, this very talented MSTP student decided to do an inducible shRNA screen in vivo versus in vitro under stem cell conditions. <clears throat> and uh, this was a mammoth enterprise. And, um, the net effect was very surprising. So the first thing that we saw uh, was that the number of hits in vivo was much higher than in vitro, okay? But the biggest thing is that they were non-overlapping by and large. So the vast majority of people do in vitro screens and do validation in vivo. And what I'm saying to you is that there's a whole world out there that's probably being missed, in fact, is being missed. Um, this has been published in Nature last year, so you can look at it, but we did a huge amount of work in terms of ChIP-seq, RNA-seq, and both in vitro and in vivo, and basically the cells in a dish are proliferating and metabolizing, whereas there are microenvironmental interactions that are occurring uh, in the in vivo situation. And the hits are non-random. They converge on this molecular process, the enhancer mediated pause release mechanism. And we, as befitting the usual approach, uh, selected one particular target, um, Jumanji protein, JMGD6. And just to show you what we were able to see is JMGD6 was uh, grade dependent and had significance in terms of patient outcome. But here's the real challenging thing is that if you do discovery, here what we found is there are three different targets. Here are the guide RNAs against JMGD6. Here are SH RNAs against two other targets. They're completely dispensable in a dish. Okay, real pain to study. But in vivo, there's a dependency. So it really creates a, a difficult discovery approach because these are, look like they're important uh, targets. So we're trying to take this back, though, in terms of more tractable system. These are the, the beads of matrix gel on which we put uh, the cells to create organoids. I always show this. This is, this is like a, a candy that I used to eat when I was young. You'd pop off these little candies. They were really kind of disgusting, but they look cool. Um, and what we can do is we can see, uh, you know, we, we weren't very smart when we were young, but uh, when we look in vivo versus uh, the organoids, we can see a greater overlap of the hits. And further, what we're starting to do is, uh, so here's, here's what you do, uh, this is supposed to be a movie, but it doesn't ever work, um, is to ask a question, the inside and the outside, because these are two different niches in a way. And so what Chris did is to use a, a dye, let it permeate, and then fact sort these two populations. And I'm not going to show you, but uh, uh, the hits are different in different regions. So uh, Sheila knows about this. This is a paper that's uh, just coming out in Cell Stem Cell. Um, and that is that a lot of people have characterized the differentiated progeny of uh, cancer stem cells as wasteful. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Luis Prada, says they're, they're waste cells. And, and what we found, though, we, I knew this for a long time. We didn't actually follow up on this. But way back when, what we did is a very simple experiment. And that is we took the cancer stem cells, put them in a mouse. They grew tumors, but they were kind of slow. The differentiated tumor cells didn't grow uh, uh, tumors at all, but put together, there was true synergy. And this is in the flank. Um, these are the survival curves. I won't go through it, but the bottom line is not only are these cancer stem cell differentiated progeny uh, important, it turns out that the, the, uh, one of the reviewers asked what I thought was a really stupid question. Actually, I still think it's a stupid question. Sorry, Sheila. Uh, but uh, they asked us to replace the differentiated tumor cells with fibroblasts, which don't occur in the brain. And the thing that's really cool, and it's a little hard to see all the different groups here, but it's completely overlapping if you add fibroblasts or uh, just the cancer stem cells alone. So there's no benefit for putting a fibroblast in, but there's an acceleration of tumor growth if you put in the, um, the more differentiated progeny. And so the question is why? So we went and looked at secreted factors because we wanted to see, get something that targeted, we could target. And what we found is uh, BDNF fit the bill. So BDNF ligand was overexpressed in the differentiated tumor cells, and the receptor was expressed in the, more different, in the uh, cancer stem cells. So here's the ligand. Cancer stem cells express lower levels, uh, but the receptor is higher in the differentiated tumor cells. And then we went and looked, because the, this is a loop, you need to see what feeds back. 
And there was a target that we found called VGF. It doesn't actually stand for anything, um, which is very confusing because everyone thinks it's VEGF, but uh, it's not. Um, and what we can see is this, this ligand is being expressed by the cancer stem cells. And this is a lot of data, which hopefully you can read uh, in the near future. But we have this, this interconnection, this reciprocal signaling, where the differentiated progeny secrete a ligand that binds to the cancer stem cell that then activates VGF, which has both an autocrine and a paracrine effect. And we've had some other reports that have kind of been similar, like, for example, um, the cancer stem cells will express uh, uh, um, other factors like BMPs that induce differentiation, but also secrete a BMP antagonist to protect itself. And so there's a presence of differentiated cells that is fundamentally important. And this is, I think, really important because I say to my folks in my lab, if cancer stem cells are so important, why isn't every cancer cell a cancer stem cell? Okay, because the fact is evolution would drive it that way. And in fact, if you take cancer stem cells, they continuously re themselves. And the reality is that there's an interplay that's occurring. And so this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. But I really think that we're doing ourselves a disservice when we just focus on cells in a dish uh, that are enriched for cancer stem cells. Um, so uh, we also, again, befitting the... Uh, the fact that you have different houses in different areas that have different uh, aspects of things. We have a recognition in the field that there are at least two populations of, as you heard, there's some controversy on some aspects of this, whether there are true cancer, uh, sorry, true two different stem cell populations, or at least an interconversion possibility, somewhat for debate, but uh, we heard in the breast very nice uh, today as well. The bottom line is there's not a single stem cell population in normal tissues. And so our hypothesis was very simple. That same thing might be present in the, the cancer stem cells. So again, what we did is have a biopsy in different regions. Uh, the dark area is necrotic. The, the white area is uh, contrast enhancing, hypervascular. And the bottom line is we see that this was published in Nature Medicine, so you can read it from last year. What we can see is the cancer stem cell markers are dichotomized between these two different regions. And so we've heard today a lot about epigenetic regulation. And so the polycombs are usually thought to act sequentially, PRC2, then PRC1, in terms of uh, DNA compaction. Uh, what we were able to see is there's actually a dichotomization in the, the relevant marks uh, between the hypoxic and the uh, perivascular region. Um, and we also found that different biologic processes were being regulated by these. So if we derive uh, stem cell populations that are uh, equivalent to these two different areas, what we can see is that the marker uh, that we chose for PRC2, EZH2, and, B and the BMI1 for PRC1 are, are somewhat dichotomized. And again, it's in the paper, but we found an E3 ligase called RNF144A that is a BMI1 degrading E3 ligase, and it is repressed by hypoxia. So in areas of hypoxia, you lose the E3 ligase for BMI1, and it comes on and lets those cells survive. So this has a, a relevance because we're seeing these uh, agents, uh, agencies against these targets going to clinical trial. And what we can see again is that there's kind of a binary response in terms of the response to, to targeting. Here's genetically, EZH2 targets these proneural cells that tend to occur in the perivascular region, whereas the hypoxic regions contain these mesenchymal subsets uh, that are more sensitive to BMI1 targeting. And here what we did is we took a whole bunch of different models, treated uh, with these two different inhibitors, and again you can see the shift of the blue and the red you can see that these two different populations really shift when you use an EZH2 versus a BMI1 inhibitor. So we came up with a brilliant idea of using them together. Uh, and it worked. But anyway, it's also toxic, so you have to have a therapeutic index. It's scary. So what we're left with is, is this idea that the cancer stem cells in different regions are regulated uh, epigenetically differently. Okay, so epigenetics, we've heard a lot of great stuff on epigenetics. I'm late to this. Uh, area, and so I'm learning very quickly. And so what we looked at was a tumor type called a Um This is, occurs in generally uh, in either um, young children or uh, older adults uh, in very different locations. So in kids, it tends to be in the brain area, uh, in the adult populations, in the spinal cord area. Um, and it's, although it's very uncommon, it's actually the third most common pediatric uh, brain tumor. 
And there's been a lot of just terrific work. Actually, today uh, on campus, there was one of the brain tumor uh, researchers uh, who contributed this, um, Scott Pomeroy. And what they've done is, so through all these studies, they've come up with a series of um, uh, position papers that have suggested four major groups. Uh, the supertentorial groups uh, include the RELA and YAP1 fused events. So these are very interesting, but I'm not going to talk about them. These are the most common, the, the posterior fossa, the type A and type B. So here what you have are two tumor types, one that occurs in boys that have no genetic events and are very lethal. Here these occur in girls, lots of chromosomal abnormalities and they have a better outcome. So it's exactly the opposite. So the more genetic aberrations you have, the better off you are. Now, it may be an immune response, but this is really an interesting aspect. So in collaboration uh, with Mike Taylor, we set off to do some enhancer uh, analyses. And I came up with this very simple hypothesis, because I'm a very simple guy, and that is that we have an epigenetic tumor. Can we use the epigenome to predict drug sensitivity? And from the fact I'm telling you the story, it's probably the truth is going to be yes. So um, one of the things that happened when we did all this work is that there was a group in Heidelberg that was competing with us. And so one of the things we did was to uh, actually engage in international diplomacy. And I got them to consolidate the data. They were going to just publish their data and just try and get us uh, screwed. But anyway, so <laughs> no other way of saying it. Uh, so the thing that was really exciting though is here we have two groups competing with one another, two sets of patients doing their sequencing in different places, and even our H3K27 acetyl antibodies were different. And what we see is you can see that greater than 90% overlap with our typical enhancers and super enhancers. Really just an outstanding control. Um, lots of uh, observations we were able to make. We were able to cluster all tumors based on the typical enhancers. We also saw uh, segregation based on the super enhancers. And uh, long story short, you can take all those four different groups and you can see the super enhancers pointing out genes that are biologically important in different areas. Uh, it can f show you new targets. Again, this uh, PFA is the one that we really want to pay attention to and we found some biologic regulators. Uh, with Jay Bradner, we did some transcription factor profiling, uh, but this is the real deliverable, and that is we were able to use the super enhancers to predict potential drugs that would be useful, and then we're able to actually show that those drugs had benefit. And now we're doing lots more work to try and pick apart uh, each of the different subgroups to look at targeting. So <clears throat> these are some unpublished data that I got permission from my lab to show. I'm usually not allowed to do what I want to do in my lab. Um, and that is the idea of this uh, modification that we've heard about before, DNA, RNA, and protein. We hear a lot about protein modifications in epigenetics. Uh, we're working uh, with Crystal Zell in terms of the M6A modification for RNA. But now we have a, a different uh, DNA modification that we have, and this is uh, uh, the N6-methyladenine uh, that occurs. And so this is a very rare event occurs. It's never been reported in a human uh, system. And uh, Chi, who uh, came to me and wanted to work on this, and we're working with Andrew Zhao up at Yale. And the thing that's very interesting is we see a dramatic increase in the M6A or N6MA levels in um, uh, glioblastoma. We looked at cancer stem cells. Long and the short is that all these uh, assays uh, show that it's specifically increased in glioblastoma. And so what you can do is you can actually do a, a study where you IP out the modification and then you do a deep sequencing. And what we're able to see is that the areas that are enriched are in the intragenic regions. And we found the sequences that look like heterochromatin. Um, and there are specific uh, uh, chromosomal locations. And so we looked at marks, chromatin marks, and particularly heterochromatin marks, and what we can see is that the heterochromatin marks um, tend to overlap with the uh, deposition of the uh, uh, N6A. And <clears throat> um, we know that these marks, they, I'm not going to go through it because we had such a nice discussion, but uh, there's a lot of biologic uh, evidence that there's a repression uh, with uh, some of these marks that we were looking at specifically. 
And um, there's also uh, previous data that suggests that there are specific demethylases that may be regulating this process. And so what we did is combine this, these uh, ideas. And what we can see is that if you add this, uh, the protein for the demethylase BH1, you deplete the, um, this modification. And also if you use a targeting approach using SHRNAs, what we can see is you also lose that heterochromatin mark. It's suggesting that first the uh, methylation event occurs and then you lose the heterochromatin modification. And then uh, we can also target it and we see an attenuation of tumor genicity. So it suggests um, that there's very interesting, just like we were talking about earlier, that there's kind of a sweet spot that if you have too much or too little of this uh, modification that it can be bad for the tumor. Um, finally, last story is that evolution is something we should pay attention to, so I'm going to talk about Zika virus. Um, this is as close to the immune system as I'm going to get today, uh, but um, this is some work uh, that uh, has done, been done partly here, and that is to say that uh, neural stem cells and progenitor cells may be sensitive to Zika virus. And so what we were able to do is take this observation and see that if you target uh, now brain tumor stem cells with Zika virus, they are very highly infected uh, and killed. Um, and what uh, further is very intriguing is that here are the survival, surviving populations from these glioma stem cells. They are killed incredibly uh, effectively, but the differentiated progeny are resistant. Um, and so we're looking at molecular mechanisms and have identified at least one major one uh, with Zika virus uh, entry. But right now, uh, we also have the ability to look at these organoids, and we can see we can target the organoids with the, the Zika virus. Um, and uh, you can look at brain specimens. And the net effect is that you can take this to a mouse model when you get an adapted uh, Zika virus. Um, and now, lots of other things being done. We're using this uh, actually with Caliber to find drug uh, virus combinations. So uh, I'm just going to skip forward and just say uh, we got a lot of press over this. Um, very exciting. We actually don't wear these yellow suits because uh, there's too much sun outside. Um, okay, well, I'm done then, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, but I was just going to say uh, thank you for the folks who, who did all the work, and uh, thank you for the patients who literally gave it themselves so we could do these studies. So thanks again. Yes, Scott. You sound surprised. <laughs> that is elegant. Scott and I talk like on a daily basis, so go ahead. Um, the, uh, and uh, I'm the one that learns uh, so much. The, um, so this is elegant work, and I guess I, I had three maybe related questions. You referred to sort of synergy um, of stem cells, and I, could, I didn't know what that was with. Was it angiogenesis or maybe? Uh, you, the synergy between the differentiated cells and the cancer stem cells? Yeah, so and you refer to your cell stem cell, maybe it's in there. Yeah, so, so that, that, the idea of there is that at least if you have a two-cell compartment, that there's direct interaction. So obviously when a, a cancer stem cell undergoes differentiation, it, it, it divides itself. So uh, we've done single cell tracing in terms of what happens to these cells. So, you know, there are different proximity and what can happen is both direct cell-cell contact but also communication with secreted factors. The fact is it's kind of like a field effect. If you look at the nervous system development, there's, there's interactions between the cells and their microenvironment and these cells uh, are able to modify their environment to create a constructive situation. So I like to call them the architects of their environment. So uh, we think about uh, stem cells are controlled because they're in specific niches. And what happens is, and it's not that cancer stem cells are not dependent on a niche, the difference is that cancer stem cells can help create their own niche. They still retain dependency. Is there interaction with uh, VEGF or angiogenesis? Yeah, actually, so um, we were, uh, years ago, that very first paper, we showed that VEGF is preferentially expressed by the cancer stem cells, and that's been <laughs> validated by other groups as well. Okay, two other really quick. So um, immune oncology, stem cells, we've talked about that a lot. Do, do you think there's um, potential value in combining um, cancer?
can't just stamp yeah, so right? so yes, the answer is yes. Uh, so I think you know the, already, for example, there's been studies that have shown that if you create dendritic cell vaccines against a mixed population, or you specifically get against the cancer stem cells, that the latter is more effective. Um, clearly, you need to achieve cure. You need to control every cell type. But there is, in normal stem cell biology, an immune suppression that occurs normally with the cells that are more stem-like. Um, and that's not surprising that there's a co-option in cancer, that the most immunosuppressive cells are the more uh, stem-like. Last quick one. Um, you refer to interplay between uh stem cells, and I wasn't sure what the other. Uh, Inter well, basically, there's interplay in, between cancer stem cells in every part of, of the, the tumor. Um, we're actually trying to dissect every single component of the tumor and show that there's bidirectional dialogue that's occurring. So I like to talk, I like to say that these are like Kat and I sitting in a room. We talk too much. Sometimes we listen to one another, too. So, uh, but I think there's a, um, that's a cancer stem cell, a very verbal populations. So is that, is that different, last question, than when you talk about co-opt and interplay? Are they sort of the same? Uh, well, co-opt is different. Co-opt is specific. That is that there's a pre-existent molecular or cellular mechanism that is being used in lieu of creating something new. Um, so a cancer stem cell can co-opt pre-existent vessels, but it can't co-opt a cancer cell that it's creating. So co-option is, is a, it's a more specific. There has to be there's a, a temporal aspect to it. There's a pre-existent uh, thing there, so. Yeah, I, I apologize. I've been in and out, so you might have discussed this already, but there was a really interesting paper that was published um, just like a week ago by Joseph Wu at Stanford, in which he used uh, mitotically inactivated iPS cells in mice and found that they had um, aspects of uh, perhaps a vaccine against several different types of cancer. Mm -hmm. What do you, have you given that any thought yet? I thought it was really oh, yeah. intriguing. Yeah, I mean, well, so the interplay, so, you know, Yamanaka definitely deserved his Nobel Prize for IPS, but I would say that cancer figured out IPS long before we did. So I actually had a review paper in which I talked about the Yamanaka factors as being uh, cancer stem cell regulators. And I kid you not, the reviewer said, well, if the cancer stem cells express all four of them, then they have to be teratomas. And I said, well, no. So, uh, you know, the fact is that we look and we see all the IPS factors as being important. And some people have actually used the uh, induced pluripotency to create a more, so again, the sweet spot area, you can actually drive a cell back towards a more embryonic state, so they, um, they actually become less tumorigenic. But there's kind of the sweet spot that even though that there's expression of SOX2, MYC, OX4, uh, NANOG, KLF4, LET28, LET7, you know, uh, LIN28, sorry, um, you, you can see that there's kind of this sweet spot of expression and interaction that's probably occurring. And that, um, but absolutely, I think that there's uh, more stemness aspects to, to uh, immunogenicity that are things that we can target. So, all right, well, thank you very much. We all want to see Carl, so we don't want to see me, so go ahead. <laughs>